Hello folks, this is Mr. O'Brien, and welcome to the second video quiz on Antebellum Slavery, otherwise known as the Antebellum South, Part 2. Alright, I'm reading from the notes underneath. The revolution redefined and reshaped economic freedom. Slavery was only one of many kinds of unfree labor in colonial America, indentured servants. But after the revolution, the decline of indentured servitude and apprenticeship and the transformation of paid domestic service into a job for black and white women made unfree labor for white men increasingly rare. As wage labor became more common, market revolution, and as Republican citizenship seemed more and more incompatible with the restraints of apprenticeship and indentured servitude, more white men insisted on economic freedom. By 1800, when indentured servitude had virtually ceased to exist in America, having been replaced by slavery, a distinction had hardened between freedom and slavery and a northern economy based on free labor, quote, free labor, which is working for a wage or owning a farm or a shop, and a southern economy based on slave labor. What that essentially means is, as the market revolution set in, and as more and more white men uh, were working for wages, the old classical Republican definition of freedom had to change. It was this cognitive dissonance going on. I'm white. Why are not? Why are I? Not, why are I not totally free? So we began to, or they began to, change the definition of freedom in their minds. Uh, wage work began becoming less taboo. Slavery uh, became more racially based, and blackness became more of a color of unfreedom as the 1800s rolled along. I'm continuing here. So, by the revolution, slavery was entrenched in every American colony. Nearly every founding father, north and south, owned slaves at some point. When writing of man's unalienable right to liberty in the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson owned more than a hundred slaves, all of whom made possible his pursuit of leisure and the arts and sciences. So again, it's kind of like slavery made their freedom possible. Talk about a contradiction. Some patriots argued that slavery for blacks allowed freedom for whites. Hey, did I just say that? By removing the dependent poor from the political nation and giving white men economic independence. Thomas Jefferson, in his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia, published in 1785, claimed that blacks, because of their nature and experience of slavery, were disloyal to America. And he speculated that blacks were inherently inferior to whites. Not only are they behind Anglo-Saxons in the whole civilization scale, uh, they will never catch up. They're inherently inferior, he argued. While he believed that Indians might have the capacity to become as civilized as whites, he did not believe blacks naturally had this capacity. I've got to stop stealing my own thunder here. While hoping for the end of slavery and opposing the slave trade, he also supported colonization or the idea that blacks, once freed from slavery, could never fully be part of America and should be colonized in Africa or other parts of the Western Hemisphere. In his ambivalent approach to race and slavery, Jefferson reflected the thinking of his generation. To be against slavery prior to 1830 and to be white meant that you were, a co for the most part, you were a colonizationist. They should be freed and sent back to Africa. William Lloyd Garrison in the 1830s, the Grimke sisters, that's when you begin to see some white people arguing differently. They should be emancipated immediately, and they should stay here. They are citizens. All right, moving on. Antebellum Southern Plantation Life. We're moving on in the 1800s. Again, reading from the bottom here. The status of free blacks in the early republic was ambiguous. It was unclear. The Constitution did not initially define who are citizens of the U.S., so individual states defined the boundaries of freedom. In some states, North and South, free blacks had some rights, including the right to vote. But the vast majority of blacks were enslaved, and slaves were not considered members of the nation or fully eligible for citizenship if free. Early immigration policy shows that Americans excluded blacks from their conception of who was an American. The Naturalization Act passed by Congress in 1790. The Naturalization Act is the act, an act, that defines um, who can come here from another country and become a naturalized citizen. So in 1790, they first defined American nationality by allowing only, quote, free white persons to emigrate and become citizens. Basically, free white Europeans. 
were, who, who were eligible to become American citizens in 1790. Although some believe that this law initiated an open immigration policy, the word white in the law excluded the majority of mankind from coming to America and becoming citizens. Remember the lion's share of the free white population emigrating to the U.S. at that time were Anglo-Saxons. It wasn't until the Irish began to come here in the 1830s that a curveball was thrown into that whole definition of a person who, become, who can become a citizen. They began to challenge the, the white, uh, the conception of white, whiteness. All right, slave-owning families. So if you look at the chart here, this is meant to show you the breakdown uh, of, this, of who owned who owned how many slaves. All right, so about 68,000 in 1850, 68,000 families down south owned one slave. 105,000 families owned two to four, and almost 81,000 owned five to nine. So the majority of Southerners are in this category from one to ten. About 55,000 families down south owned 10 to 19 slaves, and almost 30,000 owned 20 to 49 slaves. Six, about 6,000 owned 50 to 99, and about 1,700 owned 100 or more slaves. That would be the Jefferson category. So, if one out of every four families down south owned a slave, the majority of that one out of, the, out of four owned one to ten, one to nine, one to ten slaves, but there were about 8,000 plantations with 50 or more slaves. Um, and we're talking, you know, tens of acres to thousands of acres. Tens of thousands of acres of land. All right. Uh, about 88 families owned more than 300 slaves. To give you an idea, the, the one percenters. And there was even one family with over a thousand slaves. A rice uh, plantation owner. Very, rice was very, very enriching. All right, let's move on. So you can see here a typical image of a of slaves, uh, a slave cabin on the plantation. Here you see slaves posing in front of the ca their cabin on a southern plantation. Now this is a later photograph. Remember, photography did not come around until the Civil War. All right, so if you ever want to become stupider, you can watch Gone with the Wind, at least as far as slavery goes. It's a pretty good feminist story, but as far as uh, slavery goes, uh, it's pretty much a plantation myth. As we will go along in this unit, you will see that part of the southern argument for slavery became we're helping them, they're content, look at them, they're singing on the plantation, they're playing instruments, they're happy when they're at church, so they must be content with this. And also, they're, they're not smart enough to, to be aware of their own freedom. So the South, but we're telling themselves these things, that whole cognitive dissonance thing again. I know I'm a good person, but I'm holding a slave. How can I reconcile that in my head? I know, we're helping them. They like this. If Gone with the Wind were to be your only exposure to New World slavery or American slavery, you would think they didn't dislike it all that much. Okay? Uh, so, Gone with the Wind, even though it was made in 1935, still perpetuates that myth of slavery that they were content with it. All right, Not that much different from a movie we will watch later in the unit called Birth of a Nation. All right, so let's move on. Some U.S. laws regarding slavery. This is just a reminder. Don't forget in the U.S. Constitution we had the Three-Fifths Compromise. We had the Fugitive Slave Clause. All right. In 1793, uh, as a result of the clause, Congress passes an act uh, guaranteeing that the North will protect slavery for the South and theoret theoretically return any fugitive slaves. In 1850, which we haven't gotten to yet, uh, there was a stronger Fugitive Slave Act passed, especially because by 1850 the North had a habit of not enforcing, or very weakly enforcing, making it almost impossible uh, to claim a runaway slave on the part of the South. All right, let's get to some other laws and historical events. So the name of this slide is Southern Slavery. Was it an aberration? So in the 1780s, you see the first anti-slavery society created in Philly. Benjamin Franklin, remember, was one of the presidents of that society. By 1804, slavery was eliminated, eliminated from the last northern state. Most of, most of it was gradual. Remember, New Jersey had 18 slaves when the Civil War began. So it was gradual for most. In 1807, you have the legal termination of the slave trade from Africa 
on the state. Many states did that by 1808. You have it on the national level. So no more middle passage coming from Africa by 1807, 1808. 1820s, the newly independent republics of Central and South America declared their slaves free. By 1833, slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire, meaning their colonies, Canada. Uh, 1844, France abolishes it in their colonies. 1861, Russia um, uh, emancipates their serfs, which are somewhat equivalent to uh, New World slaves. All right. Uh, remember, we were, the, we were the third to last country to get rid of slavery. Cuba and Brazil followed us. All right, moving on. So... To protect the system of slavery, especially because the North was increasingly becoming, uh, quote, free labor, meaning you can sell your own labor, the South was investing in the market revolution and factories, the South was investing in slavery, and again, this is, this is a contradiction. The South was telling themselves they like this system, they're content with it, yet they kept trying to run away. I just can't explain that. So they had to have a high cost uh, for trying to leave, for rebelling. So punishments became harsher and harsher as time went on. So there was a high cost of keeping slaves from escaping for the South. So remember, the slaves on the plantation outnumbered the slave holders. So also remember, the slaves were now born in the United States, therefore they were more familiar with their surroundings, their culture, and the English language. Less of a fish-out-of-water quality. So the goal on the part of the South was to raise the, quote, exit cost. How do you do that? You have slave patrols. You hire poor white people uh, to go around uh, with weapons looking for slaves at night trying to run away. Uh, they would cut off a toe or a foot if you were caught trying to run away. And I don't know why that middle bullet came last, but they also began to legally limit black-white interaction. 